Hey folks, I'm excited to share some stories with you today that I've written myself. Whether you're a long-time follower or just joining us, I'd love to hear your thoughts on these tales. Don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe if you're new here. Let's dive in and I hope you enjoy. I joined a cult on the dark web. Now they won't let me leave. Hey, everyone. I've never posted on here before, but I need to get this off my chest. I've been holding this in for too long, and I honestly don't know how much longer I can keep going. Maybe writing it all down will help, or at least warn someone else not to make the same mistake I did. It all started a little over a year ago. I was going through a rough patch lost my job, broke up with my girlfriend, and my parents were constantly on my back about getting my life together. I spent most of my days holed up in my room, browsing the internet for hours on end. That's when I stumbled upon the dark web. I had always been curious about it, but never had the guts to actually explore it. With nothing left to lose, I decided to dive in. At first, it was mostly harmless. Forums, weird videos, and some sketchy marketplaces. But then I found a forum that changed everything. It was called The Brotherhood of Ascension. The name sounded kind of culty, but the discussions were mostly about philosophy, self-improvement, and achieving higher consciousness. It seemed intriguing, so I lurked for a while reading threads, and trying to understand what they were about. The members were very secretive, but they talked about ascension like it was the ultimate goal in life. They claimed it was a way to break free from the mundane world and achieve true enlightenment. I was skeptical, but I was also desperate for something to give my life meaning. After a few weeks, I decided to join the forum and see if I could learn more. To become a member, you had to pass a series of tests. They started out simple. Philosophical questions, personal reflections, that kind of thing. But as I progressed, the tests got weirder and more intense. One task involved fasting for three days and documenting the experience. Another required me to perform a ritual at midnight, which involved burning a piece of paper with my deepest fear written on it. It felt silly, but I was drawn in by the community and the promise of something greater. After about a month, I was invited to join a private chat room with some of the higher ranking members. This is where things started to get really strange. They told me that to ascend I needed to shed my earthly attachments. They encouraged me to cut ties with friends and family, to quit my job, which was easy since I was unemployed, and to dedicate myself fully to the Brotherhood. I was hesitant, but the more time I spent talking to them, the more I felt like they were the only ones who truly understood me. I started following their instructions isolating myself more and more. They introduced me to a practice they called the cleansing, which involved long periods of meditation and self-reflection. It was during one of these sessions that I had my first vision. I saw myself standing in a field surrounded by hooded figures. They were chanting in a language I didn't understand, but it felt oddly comforting. When I told the others about it, they said it was a sign that I was on the right path. Things took a darker turn when they introduced me to the concept of the offering. They explained that to truly ascend, one had to make a sacrifice. I was horrified at first, but they assured me it wasn't about killing someone. It was about giving up something of great personal value. They said it could be anything, an object, a relationship, 
even a part of myself. The more I thought about it, the more it made sense in a twisted kind of way. I was willing to do whatever it took to find meaning and purpose. I decided my offering would be my sense of self. I know it sounds crazy, but at the time, it felt like the right thing to do. I spent days in isolation, meditating and focusing on letting go of my ego. When I finally felt ready, I contacted the Brotherhood and told them I was prepared. They congratulated me and said the final step was to participate in a live ceremony on a video call. I logged in at the appointed time and my screen filled with faces of hooded figures. They began chanting and I felt myself slipping into a trance-like state. One of them, who seemed to be the leader, spoke directly to me. He told me to close my eyes and repeat after him. The words were in that same strange language, but I felt compelled to obey. As I chanted, I felt a strange sensation, like something was being pulled out of me. When it was over, I felt empty, like a part of me was missing. The leader told me I had done well and that I was now on the path to true ascension. But instead of feeling enlightened, I felt hollow and terrified. I tried to back out, to tell them I didn't want to do this anymore, but they wouldn't listen. They said I was too far gone and that leaving the Brotherhood would be worse than staying. I started having nightmares, visions of the hooded figures coming for me, chanting and reaching out with skeletal hands. I couldn't sleep, couldn't eat couldn't think straight. I tried to contact the outside world, but every time I did, something bad would happen. My phone would glitch out, my internet connection would drop, and I even started receiving threatening messages from anonymous accounts. I realized too late that I had gotten myself into something far more sinister than I could have ever imagined. I'm trapped and I don't know how to get out. I can't go to the police. They wouldn't believe me, and I have no proof. I can't tell my family. They've already cut me off because of how distant I've become. I'm alone, and I'm scared. Please, if you're reading this, stay away from the dark web. Don't let curiosity lead you down the same path I took. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I needed to share my story in the hope that it might save someone else. After that first horrifying experience, I tried to carry on as normally as possible, but my life was spiraling out of control. The nightmares continued, and the sense of emptiness grew worse with each passing day. The Brotherhood kept contacting me, urging me to participate in more rituals and ceremonies. They said it was the only way to fill the void I was feeling. One night, I received a message from the leader. He said I needed to come to a physical location for the next stage of my ascension. This was different from the previous instructions and it terrified me. They provided an address in a city a few hours away and told me to come alone. Against my better judgment, I felt compelled to go. It was like they had some kind of hold over me, something I couldn't resist. I drove to the location, a dilapidated warehouse on the outskirts of town. The area was desolate, with broken windows and graffiti-covered walls. My heart pounded as I approached the entrance. A man in a hooded robe greeted me and led me inside. The place was dark lit only by flickering candles. The air was thick with the smell of incense and something metallic that I couldn't quite place. They guided me to a large room where a group of hooded figures stood in a circle. The leader was there, his face hidden in the shadows. He welcomed me and said it was time for the binding. I had no idea what that meant, but I was too scared to ask. They handed me a robe and instructed me to put it on. I did as I was told, 
my hands shaking uncontrollably. Once I was robed, they began chanting. The sound reverberated through the room, making my skin crawl. The leader stepped forward, holding a dagger with a strange symbol etched into the blade. He placed the tip of the dagger on my chest, just over my heart. I could feel the cold metal against my skin, and I wanted to scream, to run, but my body wouldn't move. He started speaking in that same unfamiliar language, and the others joined in. The room seemed to close in on me, the darkness pressing against my mind. Suddenly, I felt a sharp pain as the leader pressed the dagger harder against my chest. He didn't break the skin, but the pressure was enough to make me gasp. The chanting grew louder, and the pain intensified. I felt like my very soul was being pulled apart. Then as quickly as it began, it was over. The leader removed the dagger, and the pain subsided, leaving me breathless and trembling. He told me that I was now bound to the Brotherhood, and that there was no turning back. I was one of them, whether I liked it or not. They sent me home after that, but nothing felt the same. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. My dreams became even more vivid and disturbing. I would wake up in a cold sweat, my heart racing, convinced that someone was in the room with me. I started seeing shadows out of the corner of my eye, hearing whispers that I couldn't quite make out. The Brotherhood kept demanding more of me. They wanted me to recruit others, to spread their message and bring more people into the fold. I tried to resist, but every time I did, something terrible would happen. I'd lose power in my apartment, my car would break down, or I'd find strange symbols carved into my furniture. It was like they had complete control over my life. One night, I received another message from the leader. He said it was time for the final stage of my ascension. This time, I had to make a real offering, something that would prove my loyalty beyond a shadow of a doubt. They wanted me to bring someone to them, someone who would be willing to join the Brotherhood and make their own sacrifice. I couldn't do it. I couldn't drag someone else into this nightmare. I tried to refuse, but the leader told me there would be consequences if I didn't comply. He reminded me of the power they had over me and how they could make my life a living hell if they chose to. I felt trapped, like a rat in a maze with no way out. Desperate, I decided to go to the police. I gathered what little evidence I had, the messages, the symbols, the photos of the warehouse, and went to the station. I told them everything, hoping they would believe me and help me get out of this mess, but they just looked at me like I was crazy. Without concrete proof, there was nothing they could do. They took my statement and sent me on my way, loving me feeling more alone and vulnerable than ever. I knew then that I was on my own. The Brotherhood wasn't going to let me go, and no one was going to help me. I had to find a way to escape their grasp but I had no idea how. The fear and paranoia consumed me, making it impossible to think clearly. I started planning my escape in secret. I gathered supplies, money, and anything else I thought I might need. I decided to leave everything behind and disappear, hoping that if I could get far enough away, the Brotherhood wouldn't be able to find me. It was a long shot, but it was the only chance I had left. The night I decided to leave, I packed my bags and took one last look around my apartment. I knew I couldn't come back, and the thought of leaving everything behind was almost too much to bear, but I had no choice. I couldn't stay and let them destroy me. As I drove away, I felt a glimmer of hope for the first time in months. Maybe I could outrun them, 
start a new life somewhere far away. But deep down, I knew it wouldn't be that easy. The Brotherhood had ways of finding people, and I had no idea how far their reach extended. I've been on the run ever since, moving from place to place, never staying in one spot for too long. I changed my name, my appearance, everything about me to stay hidden. But no matter where I go, I can't shake the feeling that they're still watching, still waiting for the right moment to drag me back into their twisted world. I don't know how much longer I can keep running. I'm exhausted, constantly looking over my shoulder, never knowing who I can trust. I just hope that by sharing my story, I can warn others about the dangers of the dark web and the horrors that lurk within. After months of running, paranoia had become my constant companion. Every shadow seemed threatening, and every stranger seemed like a potential member of the Brotherhood. I moved from city to city, staying in cheap motels and avoiding any contact with people. My life had become a series of sleepless nights and anxious days. One evening, while in a dingy motel room on the outskirts of a small town, I heard a knock on the door. My heart nearly stopped. I hadn't ordered anything, and no one knew I was here. Slowly, I approached the door, peering through the peephole. It was a woman, probably in her early thirties, looking as scared as I felt. I hesitated, but then opened the door, just a crack. Are you... Are you the one who posted about the Brotherhood? She asked, in a shaky voice. My heart raced. How had she found me? But the fear and desperation in her eyes mirrored my own, and I took a chance. Yes, I whispered. Come in, quickly. She slipped inside, and I locked the door behind her. She introduced herself as Lisa and explained that she had seen my post online. She too had fallen into the clutches of the Brotherhood and was looking for a way out. Her story was eerily similar to mine, starting with innocent curiosity, leading to rituals, and ending in a terrifying realization of what she had gotten into. We decided to join forces. Having someone else who understood what I was going through was a small comfort. We spent the next few days planning our next move, trying to figure out how to escape their grasp permanently. Lisa had some contacts who might be able to help, people who specialized in helping individuals disappear. It was risky, but we were out of options. One night, as we were finalizing our plans, we heard a loud crash. Someone had broken the window in the next room. We looked at each other, panic in our eyes. They had found us. We grabbed our bags and bolted out to the back door, running into the woods behind the motel. We ran for what felt like hours, the sounds of footsteps and voices echoing behind us. Eventually, we found a small abandoned cabin and hid inside. We sat in the dark, trying to catch our breath. Lisa was shaking and I felt like I was on the verge of a breakdown. We couldn't stay there long, but it gave us a moment to regroup. I knew we had to keep moving, but we needed a plan. The Brotherhood was relentless, and I had no doubt they would keep searching until they found us. As dawn approached, we decided to head to one of Lisa's contacts, a man named Greg, who lived a few towns over. He was known for helping people disappear, creating new identities and providing safe havens. It was a long shot, but it was all we had. The journey to Greg's place was tense. We took back roads, constantly checking for any signs of being followed. When we finally arrived, it was a modest house on a secluded property. Greg was an older man, rough around the edges, but he seemed trustworthy. He listened to our story without judgment and agreed to help. For the next few days, Greg worked on setting us up with new identities. 
He gave us fake IDs, new names, and instructions on how to start fresh. He even provided us with a safe house in a remote location where we could lay low for a while. It felt like we might finally be able to escape the nightmare, but the Brotherhood had other plans. On the night before we were set to leave, Greg's house was attacked. Hooded figures swarmed the property, breaking down doors and windows. Greg tried to fight them off, but they overpowered him. Lisa and I barely escaped with our lives, fleeing into the night once again. We drove for hours, not knowing where we were going, just trying to put as much distance between us and the Brotherhood as possible. Exhausted and terrified, we finally stopped at a rest area to catch our breath. That's when I noticed a familiar symbol carved into the picnic table. One of the symbols from the Brotherhood. Panic set in. We couldn't outrun them. They were everywhere, always one step ahead. Lisa and I argued about what to do next. She wanted to keep running, but I knew it was futile. We needed a different approach, something that would put an end to this once and for all. That's when I had an idea. The Brotherhood thrived on secrecy and fear. If we could expose them, maybe we could turn the tables. We decided to gather as much evidence as we could. Photos, recordings, anything that would prove their existence and their crimes. Then we would go public, sharing everything online and with the authorities. It was a dangerous plan, but it was the only chance we had left. We spent the next few days gathering evidence, using hidden cameras and recording devices. We even managed to infiltrate one of their ceremonies, capturing footage that was both horrifying and incriminating. With everything in hand, we went to the nearest city and found a public library. There, we uploaded all the evidence to multiple online platforms, sending it to news outlets, forums, and social media. We hoped that by shining a light on the Brotherhood, we could weaken their power and find some semblance of safety. But even as we hit send, I couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't over. The Brotherhood was powerful and far-reaching. They wouldn't go down without a fight. And as we left the library, I couldn't help but feel that our real battle was just beginning. Uploading the evidence gave us a fleeting sense of triumph. As the information spread, the public reaction was immediate. News outlets picked up the story, and social media exploded with discussions about the Brotherhood of Ascension. People were horrified by what they saw. Rituals, sacrifices, and the sinister manipulation of vulnerable individuals. For a moment, it felt like we had struck a significant blow against them, but that moment didn't last. The Brotherhood was more resilient and resourceful than we anticipated. They quickly went on the offensive, flooding the internet with misinformation and discrediting our claims. They called us frauds, claiming the footage was doctored and that we were disgruntled former members trying to tarnish their reputation. To my horror, many people believed them, dismissing our story as an elaborate hoax. Meanwhile, Lisa and I were living on the edge, constantly moving, never staying in one place for more than a few hours. The paranoia was overwhelming. Every time we thought we were safe, we'd notice someone watching us or find a symbol of the Brotherhood carved or painted nearby. The reach of this cult was terrifyingly extensive, and it felt like there was nowhere we could hide. One night, while staying in a small cabin deep in the woods, we received an email. It was from an anonymous sender, but the message was clear. We know where you are. You can't hide forever. Come back, and we might let you live. Attached to the email, 
was a photo of the cabin we were in, taken from the outside. We were trapped. There was no way we could stay there, but running seemed pointless. As we packed our things, the tension was palpable. Lisa was shaking, tears streaming down her face. What are we going to do? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. I didn't have an answer. I felt just as lost and scared as she did. As we fled into the night, I realized we needed help. Real help. Not just from friends or random internet users. We needed someone who understood the depths of what we were dealing with. Someone who could fight back against the Brotherhood's influence. That's when I remembered a name I had come across during my initial dive into the dark web. A notorious hacker known only as Spectre. Rumor had it that Spectre had taken down major criminal organizations and was a ghost in the digital world. It took some doing, but through a series of encrypted messages and dangerous connections, we managed to get in touch with Spectre. They agreed to meet us in person, and we arranged a meeting in a secluded park, far from any prying eyes. Spectre turned out to be a young woman, surprisingly unassuming, with a quiet confidence that put us at ease. She listened to our story without interrupting, her expression never changing. When we finished, she nodded. I've heard of the Brotherhood, she said. They're bad news, but I can help you. Spectre's plan was risky, but our best shot. She would use her skills to dig deeper into the Brotherhood's operations, exposing their secrets and cutting off their resources. In the meantime, she advised us to stay hidden, using a series of safe houses she had set up on situations like ours. The next few weeks were a blur. We moved from one safe house to another, always on edge, always expecting the worst. Spectre kept us updated on her progress. She hacked into their financial records, exposing illegal transactions and connections to powerful figures. She uncovered hidden forums and chat rooms where they coordinated their activities. With each new revelation, the Brotherhood's power base crumbled a little more. But the Brotherhood wasn't going down without a fight. They retaliated, attacking Spectre's networks, trying to track her down. It was a digital war, and we were caught in the middle. Spectre assured us she could handle it, but the strain was starting to show. The constant moving, the fear, the uncertainty. It was taking its toll on all of us. One night while staying in yet another safe house, I received a message on my phone. It was from Spectre. They found me. They're coming. My blood ran cold. If they caught Spectre, we were done for. I woke Lisa and we quickly gathered our things, ready to run again. But as we headed for the door, there was a loud bang, and the world went dark. I woke up in a small windowless room, my hands and feet bound. The air was cold and damp, and the only light came from a single flickering bulb hanging from the ceiling. Lisa was next to me, still unconscious. I struggled against the restraints, but it was no use. Panic set in as I realized we had been captured. The door creaked open and the leader of the Brotherhood stepped inside, his hooded figure casting a long shadow. Did you really think you could escape us? He sneered. You've caused us a great deal of trouble, but it's over now. They took us to a larger room where several members of the Brotherhood were gathered. The leader began to speak, his voice echoing off the walls. You have been judged and found wanting, but there is still a chance for redemption. Complete the final offering, and you will be free. I didn't understand. What offering? What did they want from us now? The leader gestured, and two members brought in a small wooden box. 
they opened it to reveal a dagger, the same one used in the binding ritual. One of you must make the ultimate sacrifice, the leader said. Only then will you be allowed to leave. I looked at Lisa, her eyes wide with terror. They wanted one of us to kill the other. It was the ultimate test of loyalty, the ultimate act of submission. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't. But if I refused, they would kill us both. The leader handed me the dagger, and the room fell silent. My hands shook as I held the cold metal, the weight of it pressing down on me. I couldn't breathe, couldn't think. Lisa's eyes pleaded with me, tears streaming down her face. I couldn't do this. I couldn't. Just as I was about to drop the dagger, there was a loud crash. The door burst open and a group of armed men stormed in, shouting orders. Chaos erupted as the Brotherhood members tried to fight back, but they were quickly subdued. One of the men rushed over to us, cutting our restraints and helping us to our feet. Are you okay? He asked, his voice urgent. We're here to help. Spectre sent us. Relief washed over Smee as I realized we were saved. Spectre had come through after all. The armed men, private security hired by Spectre, escorted us out of the building and into a waiting van. As we sped away, I couldn't help but look back, half expecting the Brotherhood to come after us. Spectre met us at a secure location, looking exhausted but triumphant. It's over, she said. The Brotherhood's leaders have been arrested and their operations are in shambles. You're safe now. I wanted to believe her, but the fear and paranoia were still there, lurking in the back of my mind. It would take time to heal, to trust that we were truly free. But for now, I was grateful to be alive, grateful that Lisa and I had made it through this nightmare together. We decided to start fresh, to build new lives far away from the darkness that had consumed us. It wouldn't be easy, but with Spectre's help, we had a fighting chance. As we drove away from the horrors of our past, I couldn't help but feel a glimmer of hope. Maybe, just maybe, we could finally find peace. Starting over was harder than I had ever imagined. Even though the Brotherhood's leaders were arrested and their operations disrupted, the psychological scars ran deep. Lisa and I moved to a small town in a different state, adopting new identities and trying to build a semblance of a normal life. Spectre remained in touch, helping us with everything from securing new documents to setting up secure communication channels. For the first few weeks, we lived in a state of hypervigilance. Every unfamiliar face seemed like a potential threat. Every unexpected noise made us jump. We tried to keep our heads down, blending into our new community as best we could. Lisa found a job at a local bookstore, and I managed to get hired as a freelance graphic designer. We were slowly finding our footing, but the shadows of our past were never far behind. One night, as we were having dinner, my phone buzzed with a message. It was from Spectre. I need to see you. Urgent. My heart sank. We had hoped that our contact with her would eventually fade, a sign that our lives were returning to normal. But this message shattered that illusion. We met Spectre at a secluded cafe on the outskirts of the town. She looked more worn out than the last time we saw her, a sign that the battle against the Brotherhood had taken its toll. She wasted no time in getting to the point. They're regrouping, she said, her voice low and urgent. The remaining members are trying to rebuild. They won't stop until they find you. A cold dread settled over me. Despite all our efforts, we were still targets. Spectre explained that while many of the Brotherhood's leaders were in custody, a few 
had managed to evade capture. These remnants were even more fanatical, driven by a desire for revenge and the belief that completing our ascension was crucial to their cause. We need to finish this, Spectre said. We need to take down the rest of them. Once and for all, Lisa and I exchanged a weary look. We had hoped for a different kind of future, one where we could leave the past behind. But it was clear that as long as the Brotherhood existed, we would never be free. With heavy hearts, we agreed to help Spectre. She had a plan to locate the remaining members and expose their activities to the authorities. It would be dangerous, but it was our only chance to end this nightmare for good. The next few weeks were a blur of preparation and planning. Spectre provided us with the tools and training we needed to gather information and avoid detection. We were essentially going undercover, infiltrating the remnants of the Brotherhood to gather evidence of their illegal activities. Our first target was a small cell operating out of a nondescript suburban home. Posing as potential recruits, Lisa and I managed to gain their trust. The rituals and meetings were eerily reminiscent of our initial experiences with the Brotherhood, and it took all our strength to keep up the facade. During one of the meetings, we managed to plant recording devices and gather crucial information about their operations. The evidence was damning, detailed plans of new rituals, financial records linking them to illegal activities, and lists of potential recruits. We passed everything on to Spectre, who worked tirelessly to compile the data and prepare it for the authorities. The night we handed over the final batch of evidence was tense. We met Spectre in a remote location, exchanging data drives and going over the final steps of our plan. She assured us that the authorities were ready to move in, that they had enough to shut down the remaining cells for good. As we drove back to our safe house, I allowed myself to hope. Maybe this time, we had really done it. Maybe this time, we could finally be free. But the Brotherhood had one last card to play. We were ambushed as we arrived home. Hooded figures surrounded our car, dragging us out and binding our hands. It was like a nightmare come to life. They forced us into the house, where a familiar figure awaited, the leader who had orchestrated our binding ritual. I told you, you can't escape us, he sneered. You belong to the Brotherhood. They tied us to chairs, preparing for some final horrific ritual. My mind raced, trying to think of a way out. As the leader began chanting, I noticed Lisa struggling against her restraints, her eyes filled with determination. In a sudden desperate move, she managed to break free, using the chair leg to knock the dagger from the leader's hand. Chaos erupted. I took advantage of the distraction to free myself, and we fought back with everything we had. It was a blur of movement, fear, and adrenaline. Just as it seemed we were about to be overpowered, the door burst open and Spectre, accompanied by armed officers, stormed in. The remaining Brotherhood members were quickly subdued and the leader was finally taken into custody. The relief was overwhelming. We had done it. With Spectre's help, we had dismantled the last remnants of the Brotherhood. In the aftermath, Lisa and I were placed in witness protection, given new identities and relocated to a place where we could truly start over. Spectre promised to keep in touch, ensuring our safety and providing updates on the legal proceedings against the Brotherhood. It took time, but gradually we began to rebuild our lives. The fear and paranoia slowly faded, replaced by a cautious optimism. We knew that the shadows of our past would always be there, 
but we were determined to create a future free from the horrors we had endured. I still have nightmares and there are moments when I feel like I'm being watched, but for the first time in a long time, I feel hope. Hope that the Brotherhood is finally defeated and hope that we can find peace. To anyone reading this, heed my warning. The dark web is a dangerous place and the allure of secret societies and hidden knowledge can lead you down a path of unimaginable terror. Stay safe and never let curiosity lead you into the darkness. This is my story and I pray it serves as a warning. Be careful out there. I found the Russian experiment on the dark web. You won't believe what happened to my roommate. I've always been a bit of a night owl, spending countless hours trawling through the deepest, darkest corners of the internet. It started as a hobby, then became an obsession, and finally, a bit of a curse. It was during one of these late night sessions that I stumbled upon something that would change my life forever. I found a link on a sketchy forum promising access to the kind of dark web content that even seasoned explorers wouldn't dare to click on. It was labeled the Russian experiment. I know what you're thinking. Sounds like some cliche horror movie plot, right? Trust me, I thought the same thing. But curiosity got the better of me. I clicked the link and after what felt like an eternity of loading, I was faced with a login screen. The username and password were provided in the forum post, so I entered them and held my breath. The site was a labyrinth of cryptic messages, strange symbols, and grainy video footage. I navigated through it, feeling my heart pound harder with each click. Eventually, I found a folder labeled Experiment 27A. Inside, there were dozens of video files. I randomly picked one and pressed play. The screen flickered and then showed a dimly lit room with a single figure strapped to a metal chair. The person looked malnourished, their skin pale and stretched tight over their bones. A voice, speaking in heavily accented English, began to narrate. This is subject 27A. The objective of this phase is to test the limits of human endurance under extreme conditions. I couldn't tear my eyes away from the screen as the camera zoomed in on the subject's face. They were gaunt, with hollow eyes that seemed to stare straight through the screen and into my soul. The voice continued to explain the procedures, sleep deprivation, sensory overload, and chemical injections. It was horrifying. Then the real nightmare began. The subject started to scream, a guttural sound that made my blood run cold. The camera didn't flinch, capturing every agonizing moment. I felt sick to my stomach, but I couldn't stop watching. It was like a train wreck. You know it's terrible, but you can't look away. Hours must have passed as I watched video after video, each more disturbing than the last. The subjects were put through unimaginable pain and suffering. It was clear these experiments weren't just about endurance. They were pushing these people to the brink of insanity. I finally snapped out of my trance when my roommate Jake burst into the room. Dude, it's 3 a.m. What the hell are you doing? He asked, rubbing his eyes. I quickly closed the browser and turned to him, my heart still racing. Nothing, man. Just couldn't sleep, I stammered, trying to act casual. Jake raised an eyebrow. Whatever. Just keep it down, he muttered, before heading back to his room. I took a deep breath and tried to calm myself. I knew I should stop, 
but I was already hooked. I needed to know more. Over the next few days, I became obsessed with the site, watching every video I could find. I started neglecting my responsibilities, skipping classes, and avoiding friends. Jake noticed my change in behavior, but I brushed off his concerns. One night, as I was deep into another video, Jake walked in again. This time, he wasn't just annoyed, he was worried. Seriously, man, you're scaring me. What's going on? I hesitated, but eventually told him everything. I showed him the site, the videos, and explained what I'd seen. Jake was skeptical at first, but curiosity got the better of him too. We ended up watching a few videos together, and I could see the horror in his eyes as he realized I wasn't exaggerating. Things took a darker turn when Jake decided to take matters into his own hands. He was a tech-savvy guy, always tinkering with computers and hacking into secure networks just for fun. He figured he could find out more about the people behind the experiments and maybe even expose them. I was hesitant, but I agreed to help him. We spent the next few nights digging deeper into the site, hacking into hidden files and uncovering more disturbing information. We found detailed logs of the experiments, lists of subjects, and even correspondence between the scientists. One document in particular caught our attention. It was a report detailing the goals of the experiments. It mentioned something called Project Skinwalker. According to the report, the ultimate aim was to create a new breed of human, capable of withstanding extreme conditions and possessing heightened senses. These skinwalkers were to be deployed in remote locations to guard secret government facilities. The more we uncovered, the more paranoid we became. We felt like we were being watched and every noise in the apartment made us jump, but we couldn't stop. We were too far in. Then one night, Jake went missing. He had been up all night, working on decrypting a particularly challenging file. I fell asleep on the couch, exhausted from the constant stress. When I woke up, Jake was gone. His laptop was still on, the screen showing lines of code, but there was no sign of him. I searched the entire apartment, called his phone, and even checked with our friends, but no one had seen him. Panic set in. Had we gone too far? Had someone come for him? Days turned into weeks, and there was still no sign of Jake. I was a wreck, barely eating or sleeping, consumed by guilt and fear. Then one night, I got an email from an unknown sender. It contained a single video file and a message. Watch and learn. With trembling hands, I opened the video. It was footage of a dark room, similar to the ones in the experiment videos. The camera zoomed in on a figure strapped to a chair. It was Jake. He looked disoriented, his eyes wild with fear. A voice I recognized from the earlier videos began to speak. Subject 28A. The objective of this phase is to test the effects of isolation and psychological manipulation. I watched in horror as they subjected Jake to the same tortures I had seen in the previous videos. He screamed, pleaded, and eventually broke down. The video ended abruptly, leaving me in a state of shock. I knew I had to do something. I couldn't just sit back and watch my friend suffer. I gathered all the information we had collected and decided to expose the truth. But before I could act, I received another email. This one contained a warning. Stop now, or you'll be next. I was paralyzed with fear. The people behind the experiments were powerful, and they were watching me. I knew I couldn't go to the authorities. They were probably involved. I was trapped with no way out. As the days passed, 
I became more and more paranoid. I felt like I was being watched, followed, and monitored. My every move was scrutinized, and I couldn't trust anyone. The weight of the secrets I carried was crushing me. Then one night, as I was about to collapse from exhaustion, I heard a noise outside my window. I peeked through the blinds and saw a shadowy figure standing in the darkness. My heart raced as I realized they had come for me. I knew I had to act fast. I gathered all the evidence, backed it up on multiple devices, and prepared to make a run for it. But before I could leave, there was a knock on the door. I froze, my mind racing with fear. Open up, or we'll break the door down, a voice commanded from the other side. I knew I had no choice. I took a deep breath and opened the door, bracing myself for the worst. But instead of the sinister agents I had imagined, I was met by two men in suits. They flashed badges, identifying themselves as government agents. We need to talk, one of them said, his tone leaving no room for argument. They sat me down and explained everything. The experiments were real, and they were part of a top secret government project. The goal was to create super soldiers capable of protecting classified installations from any threat, human or otherwise. These installations housed advanced technologies and even extraterrestrial artifacts, and the government would go to any lengths to keep them secure. The agents made it clear that I had stumbled upon something far beyond my comprehension. They offered me a choice keep my mouth shut and stay alive, or try to expose them and face the consequences. I chose to live. I deleted everything, destroyed my backups, and tried to move on. But the nightmares never stopped. I was haunted by the images of the experiments, and the guilt of abandoning Jake consumed me. Every day I live in fear, knowing that they're watching. They let me go but I know they won't hesitate to silence me if I step out of line. The truth is out there, buried in the darkest corners of the internet, but I can never share it. This is my confession, my burden. I found the Russian experiment on the dark web and it ruined my life. And now I can only hope that sharing my story here will serve as a warning. Be careful what you search for you might not like what you find. After the agents left, I was left with a gnawing sense of dread. I tried to convince myself that staying silent was the right choice, but deep down, I knew I was just prolonging the inevitable. I couldn't erase the memories, the images burned into my mind. I saw Jake's tortured face every time I closed my eyes. Days turned into weeks, and I did my best to return to a normal life. But normalcy was a distant dream. I kept to myself, avoided social interactions, and jumped at every unexpected noise. The paranoia was overwhelming, and I started to wonder if I was losing my mind. One evening, as I was mindlessly scrolling through my phone, I received a text from an unknown number. It simply read, Help me. My heart skipped a beat. It had to be Jake. There was no other explanation. I quickly typed a response, my fingers trembling. Jake, is that you? Where are you? I stared at the screen, waiting for a reply. Minutes felt like hours, but finally, another message came through. They're watching. Be careful. I knew I had to act, but I had no idea where to start. The government agents had warned me, and I had no doubt they were still monitoring my every move. But I couldn't abandon Jake again. I owed him that much. I spent the next few days trying to trace the number, using every trick Jake had taught me. But it was futile. Whoever had sent the messages was an expert at covering their tracks. 
Frustrated and desperate, I decided to go back to the dark web, hoping to find any clue that might lead me to Jake. Navigating through the dark web felt like walking through a minefield. Every click was a potential trap, every sight a potential threat, but I pressed on, driven by the need to save my friend. I revisited the forums, combing through threads for any mention of the Russian experiment or Project Skinwalker. After countless hours of searching, I found a thread discussing recent activity linked to the experiment. Users were sharing stories of strange disappearances and sightings of mysterious figures in remote areas. One user claimed to have stumbled upon a hidden server hosting live feeds of the experiments. My heart raced as I followed the links, praying I wouldn't be discovered. Finally, I accessed the server. The site was eerily similar to the one I had found months ago, but this time it was live. I clicked on one of the feeds and my blood ran cold. It was Jake. He was strapped to a chair, just like before, but he looked worse, emaciated, with sunken eyes and a vacant expression. The screen flickered and a voice I recognized began to speak. Welcome to the next phase of Project Skinwalker. Tonight we will push the limits of human transformation. I watched in horror as they injected Jake with a dark, viscous liquid. His body convulsed and he let out a blood-curdling scream. I felt helpless, knowing there was nothing I could do to stop it. The camera zoomed in on his face capturing every moment of his agony. The experiments continued for hours, each more horrifying than the last. They subjected Jake to extreme temperatures, sensory deprivation, and relentless psychological torment. It was clear they were trying to break him down, to strip away his humanity and turn him into something else. I couldn't bear to watch any more. I needed to find a way to save him. I knew I couldn't do it alone, so I reached out to the only person who might understand, an old friend who had once been involved in similar underground activities. His name was Alex, and he was a hacker, much like Jake. I hadn't spoken to Alex in years, but I hoped he would remember me. I sent him an encrypted message, explaining everything and begging for his help. To my relief, he responded almost immediately. Meet me at the old warehouse, 11 p.m. Come alone. I arrived at the warehouse, a rundown building on the outskirts of the town. The place was abandoned with broken windows and graffiti covered walls. I felt a chill run down my spine as I approached the entrance. Alex was already there waiting for me. He looked older, with a hardened expression that spoke of years spent in the shadows. We exchanged brief pleasantries before getting down to business. I've heard rumors about Project Skinwalker, Alex said, his voice low. But what you've described is far worse than anything I imagined. If we're going to save Jake, we need to be smart. The people behind this are powerful, and they won't hesitate to eliminate us if we get in their way. We spent the next few hours devising a plan. Alex had contacts who could help us, people with the skills and resources to infiltrate the facility where Jake was being held. It was risky, but it was our only hope. As we finalized our preparations, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. Every sound seemed amplified, every shadow a potential threat, but there was no turning back now. Jake's life depended on us. The night of the operation, we gathered our team, a small group of skilled hackers and ex-military operatives. We had a detailed layout of the facility, thanks to Alex's contacts and a plan to disable the security systems long enough to get in and out undetected. As we approached the facility, 
a nondescript building in the middle of nowhere. My heart pounded in my chest. This was it. Our last chance to save Jake. We moved swiftly, using the cover of darkness to our advantage. Alex and I managed to bypass the security systems, gaining access to the building. Inside, it was a maze of sterile corridors and locked doors. We navigated through, guided by the layout on Alex's tablet. Finally, we reached the room where Jake was being held. He was strapped to the chair, unconscious and barely recognizable. My heart ached as I looked at him, but I pushed the emotions aside. We had to move quickly as we freed Jake. Alarms began to blare. They knew we were there. We grabbed Jake and ran, the sound of footsteps closing in behind us. We fought our way through the facility, dodging guards and security measures. We barely made it out, escaping into the night with Jake in tow. We drove for hours, putting as much distance as possible between us and the facility. Jake was in bad shape, but he was alive. We took him to a safe house, where Alex's contacts helped us treat his injuries. It would take time for him to recover, and even longer for the psychological scars to heal. But we had done it. We had saved him. As Jake slowly regained his strength, he told us everything he remembered. The experiments were worse than we had imagined. They had tried to turn him into something else something inhuman, but he had resisted, holding on to his humanity despite the torture. We knew we couldn't stay in one place for long. The people behind Project Skinwalker would be looking for us. We went into hiding, constantly moving, always looking over our shoulders, but we had a new mission now. We were determined to expose the truth to bring down the people responsible for the horrors we had witnessed. It wouldn't be easy, and it wouldn't be safe, but we couldn't let them continue their experiments. We had to stop them, no matter the cost. And so, our fight began. A fight against an enemy shrouded in secrecy and power. A fight for justice, for Jake, and for all the victims of Project Skinwalker. The first few weeks on the run were the hardest. We were always on edge, constantly looking over our shoulders and trusting no one. We moved from safe house to safe house, relying on Alex's network of contacts to stay one step ahead of our pursuers. Jake was slowly recovering, but the psychological trauma he had endured left deep scars. Despite the danger, we were determined to bring down Project Skinwalker. We spent every waking moment gathering evidence, piecing together the puzzle, and planning our next move. It was during one of these sessions that we made a breakthrough. Alex managed to decrypt a file from the hidden server that contained a list of high-ranking officials involved in the project. Among the names, we recognized several influential figures politicians, military personnel, and even some prominent scientists. This was bigger than we had imagined. The conspiracy reached the highest levels of government, and we were just scratching the surface. We knew we needed more than just names. We needed hard evidence, something undeniable that could expose the entire operation our best chance was to infiltrate one of their secret facilities and retrieve the data directly from their servers. It was a risky plan, but we had no other choice. Using the information we had gathered, we identified a facility in a remote part of the country. It was heavily guarded and nearly impenetrable, but Alex had a contact on the inside, a disgruntled former employee who had been wronged by the organization. They agreed to help us in exchange for protection and a new identity. We spent weeks planning the operation, meticulously going over every detail. 
Our contact provided us with blueprints, security protocols, and a way in. The night of the infiltration, we were all on edge. Failure wasn't an option. We approached the facility under the cover of darkness. Our contact had arranged for a temporary power outage, giving us a small window to breach the perimeter. We moved quickly and silently, disabling security cameras and avoiding patrols. The tension was palpable, but we stayed focused. Once inside, we split up. Alex and I headed to the server room while the rest of the team secured our exit route. The facility was a maze of sterile corridors, much like the one where we had rescued Jake. Every corner we turned, I half expected to run into guards, but we encountered surprisingly little resistance. When we reached the server room, Alex went to work, hacking into the system while I kept watch. It felt like an eternity, but finally, he gave me a nod. I'm in, downloading everything now. As the data transferred, alarms started blaring. They had discovered our presence. We had minutes, maybe seconds to get out. We need to move, I urged, grabbing Alex's arm. We sprinted through the facility, alarms blaring and red lights flashing. Guards were closing in from all directions, but our team had managed to secure a path to the exit. We fought our way through, adrenaline pumping, knowing that failure meant certain death. We burst through the exit and ran to our getaway vehicle, bullets whizzing past us. We barely made it, diving into the car as our driver floored it. The facility shrank into the distance behind us, but we knew it wasn't over. We had what we came for, but now we needed to use it. Back at the safe house, we reviewed the data. It was a gold mine of information, detailed records of the experiments, communications between officials, and plans for future phases of Project Skinwalker. It was more than enough to expose the truth, but we needed to be smart about how we released it. We decided to leak the information to multiple sources simultaneously, media outlets, independent journalists, and activists. It would be harder for the government to suppress if it was spread widely and quickly. Alex and the team worked tirelessly to package the data and prepare it for release. The night we launched the leak, I barely slept. We watched as the information spread like wildfire, news outlets picking up the story, and social media buzzing with outrage. It was working. The world was finally learning the truth about Project Skinwalker. But the government wasn't going down without a fight. They launched a massive disinformation campaign, labeling the leaks as fake news and conspiracy theories. They even went after some of the journalists who had picked up the story, threatening them into silence. Despite the pushback, the truth was out there. People were questioning, demanding answers, and the pressure was mounting. We knew we had struck a nerve, but it was only a matter of time before they came for us. We stayed on the move, never staying in one place for too long. Jake was slowly healing, both physically and mentally, but the fear never left his eyes. We were all changed by what we had been through, but we couldn't stop now. There was too much at stake. Then one night, we received a message from an unexpected source, a whistleblower from within the government. They had seen the leaks and wanted to help. They had information about an even more secretive aspect of the project, something they called Phase 2. According to the whistleblower, Phase 2 involved deeper experiments with extraterrestrial technology. The government had been using the skinwalkers not just to guard secret bases, but to interact with alien artifacts and beings. The experiments we had uncovered 
were just the tip of the iceberg. The whistleblower provided us with coordinates to a hidden facility deep in the American wilderness where the most secretive and disturbing experiments were being conducted. It was a risky lead, but we knew we had to follow it. We geared up for what we knew would be our most dangerous mission yet. The journey to the facility was treacherous, taking us through dense forests and rugged terrain. We moved carefully, knowing that any mistake could be our last. As we approached the coordinates, we could feel the air change, an eerie, almost unnatural stillness. The facility was hidden in a valley, surrounded by high fences and guarded by heavily armed personnel. We knew we had to be stealthy. Using the cover of night, we infiltrated the perimeter. The facility was larger and more advanced than any we had seen before, with cutting edge technology and strange alien-like structures. It was clear that whatever was happening here was beyond human comprehension. We made our way through the facility, avoiding detection and gathering as much evidence as we could. What we found was beyond anything we had imagined. Humans and extraterrestrials being experimented on together. Strange machines that seemed to defy the laws of physics and artifacts that glowed with an otherworldly light. The deeper we went, the more disturbing it became. We stumbled upon a chamber filled with tubes containing creatures that were neither fully human nor fully alien. They were the result of the government's attempts to merge human and extraterrestrial DNA, creating hybrids with unimaginable abilities. Our presence didn't go unnoticed for long. Alarms blared, and we found ourselves in a desperate fight for survival. We managed to escape with the evidence, but just barely. The facility was a fortress, and we knew they would come after us with everything they had. Back at our safe house, we reviewed the footage and data we had collected. It was clear that the government was playing with forces beyond their control, and the implications were terrifying. We knew we had to get this information out, but the stakes were higher than ever. We prepared for the inevitable showdown, knowing that our enemies would stop at nothing to silence us. The truth about Project Skinwalker and Phase 2 was too important to keep hidden, and we were willing to risk everything to expose it. As we made our final preparations, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was just the beginning. The government's experiments were opening doors that should never be opened, and the consequences could be catastrophic. We were fighting not just for our lives, but for the future of humanity. The battle was far from over, but we were ready. The truth had to come out, no matter the cost. The day we decided to release the information about Phase 2, the tension in our safe house was palpable. Every member of our group knew the gravity of what we were about to do. Exposing the deeper layers of Project Skinwalker meant going up against forces that could obliterate us without a trace. But we had no choice. The truth was too important. We split the data into multiple packages and set up automated systems to release them simultaneously to various platforms and media outlets. We knew we had to act quickly and decisively. As the clock ticked closer to our planned release time, I couldn't help but feel a sense of impending doom. At the exact moment, our systems triggered and the information began flooding the internet. Videos, documents and testimonies spread like wildfire. Social media erupted with shock and outrage as people began to grasp the horrifying extent of the government's experiments. But we knew the initial shockwave was only the beginning. Within hours, our secure communication channels lit up with warnings. 
The government was moving fast, deploying agents to track us down. We had expected this, but the speed and intensity of their response caught us off guard. We had no choice but to abandon the safe house and go on the run once more. As we fled, we heard reports of massive disinformation campaigns. The government was doing everything in its power to discredit the leaks, branding them as elaborate hoaxes and fabrications. Prominent figures from the documents we released appeared on television, vehemently denying any involvement. It was a coordinated effort to bury the truth, but there was hope. Among the chaos, voices began to rise in support of our cause. Independent journalists, activists, and even some government insiders came forward, corroborating our findings. The public was starting to see through the lies, and a movement was building. Yet, we were far from safe. We regrouped at a remote cabin in the mountains, a place so isolated that we hoped it would buy us some time. The nights were cold and quiet, a stark contrast to the turmoil we had unleashed. Jake was slowly regaining his strength, but the psychological scars were still raw. He spent long hours staring into the fire, lost in thought. One evening, as we huddled around the fireplace, we received a message from the whistleblower who had first alerted us to phase two. They wanted to meet, despite the risks we agreed. They had information that could be crucial to our survival and the continuation of our mission. The meeting was set for a desolate clearing in the forest. We arrived early, scanning the area for any signs of an ambush. The tension was suffocating. Finally, a figure emerged from the shadows. It was a middle-aged woman, her face etched with worry and determination. My name is Dr. Emily Sloan, she introduced herself, her voice barely above a whisper. I was one of the lead scientists on Project Skinwalker before I realized the true nature of our work. Dr. Sloan revealed that the experiments had started with noble intentions using advanced technology to enhance human capabilities. But as the project evolved, it became clear that the real goal was far more sinister. The government was not just creating super soldiers, they were attempting to merge human and extraterrestrial DNA to create beings capable of interacting with alien technologies and life forms. The hybrids, she said, her voice trembling, were designed to be the perfect intermediaries between humans and extraterrestrials. But the process was horrific. Many subjects didn't survive, and those who did were changed forever. She handed us a flash drive. This contains the latest data on the hybrids and the extraterrestrial artifacts they're studying. It's the smoking gun you need to expose the full extent of the government's plans. As we spoke, a low rumble echoed through the forest. We turned to see helicopters approaching, their searchlights cutting through the darkness. They found us, Alex muttered, his face pale. Dr. Sloan looked at us with a mix of fear and resolve. Go, I'll hold them off. Get this information out there. It's our only chance. We didn't have time to argue. We grabbed the flash drive and ran, the sound of helicopter blades growing louder. Gunfire erupted behind us as we sprinted through the forest, branches whipping against our faces. It was a desperate race for survival. Somehow, we made it back to the cabin, our hearts pounding. We knew we had to move fast. Alex immediately started decrypting the data on the flash drive while the rest of us prepared to leave. We couldn't stay in one place for long. The information on the drive was even more damning than we had anticipated. Detailed reports on the hybrid experiments, evidence of direct communication with extraterrestrial beings, 
and plans for future phases that involved even more invasive and inhumane procedures. It was clear that the government's reach extended far beyond what we had initially uncovered. We devised a new plan. We would split up and spread the information through as many channels as possible, making it impossible for the government to suppress. It was a dangerous strategy, but we had no other choice. As we packed our things, Jake approached me. We need to finish this, he said, determination burning in his eyes. For everyone who suffered because of these monsters, for the truth. We set out at dawn, each of us heading in different directions with a piece of the evidence. I traveled to a nearby city, planning to meet with a trusted journalist who had shown interest in our story. The journey was nerve-wracking, every shadow a potential threat, every stranger a possible enemy. When I arrived, the journalist Sarah was waiting. She was a fierce, no-nonsense reporter known for her investigative work. I handed her the flash drive, explaining everything we had discovered. Her eyes widened as she scanned the files. This is incredible, she said, her voice filled with both awe and horror. We need to get this out there fast. We worked together, coordinating with other journalists and activists. The data spread like wildfire, each new piece adding to the growing mountain of evidence against Project Skinwalker and the government's dealings with extraterrestrial entities. As the story gained momentum, public outrage reached a boiling point. Protests erupted across the country, demanding answers and accountability. The government scrambled to contain the situation, but it was too late. The truth was out, and there was no going back. But our fight wasn't over. The government still had resources and reach, and they weren't about to let us go unpunished. We remained in hiding, constantly moving, knowing that we could never truly escape the shadow of Project Skinwalker. Despite the danger, there was a sense of accomplishment. We had exposed the horrors, the lies, and the corruption. We had given a voice to the victims and shed light on the darkest corners of our government. It was a small victory, but it was enough to keep us going. And so we continued our fight, driven by the hope that one day justice would prevail. We knew the road ahead would be long and perilous, but we were ready. We had faced the darkness and survived. Now we would shine a light on it for the world to see. Our journey was far from over, but we were no longer alone. The truth was a powerful ally, and with it, we would continue to expose the secrets that others wanted to keep hidden. For Jake, for the victims of Project Skinwalker, and for the future of humanity, we would never stop fighting. The fallout from our leak continued to ripple through the media and public consciousness. The government's disinformation campaign struggled to keep up with the relentless tide of evidence and testimony that we and our allies had released. The truth was out, and it was a beacon for those willing to look past the lies. We knew our actions had put us at the top of a very dangerous list. Moving from one safe house to another, we communicated through secure channels, always wary of being tracked. The fear of being caught was a constant companion, but it was also a reminder of why we were fighting. One night, while holed up in a remote cabin, deep in the mountains, we received an urgent message from Dr. Sloan. She had more information, vital data about the deeper layers of the government's extraterrestrial experiments. She had managed to escape their clutches but she was on the run and needed our help. We arranged a meeting at a secluded location, taking every precaution to avoid detection. Dr. Sloan arrived, looking exhausted but determined. 
she handed us a small encrypted drive. This is everything, she said, her voice barely a whisper. The real purpose behind Project Skinwalker. They're preparing for something big, something that could change the course of humanity. We didn't waste any time. Alex decrypted the drive, and what we found was beyond anything we had imagined. Detailed reports, blueprints, and communication logs revealed a plan to use the hybrids not just for guarding secret installations, but for direct engagement with extraterrestrial beings. The government had established contact with an alien race, and the hybrids were meant to act as intermediaries, negotiating and collaborating on unknown projects. But the most chilling revelation was a contingency plan. If the hybrids failed to meet expectations, the government was prepared to unleash a new phase of experiments, ones that involved the general population. They were willing to sacrifice countless lives to perfect their abominable creations. We knew we had to act fast. The data needed to reach the public, but this time we had to be even more strategic. The government's response to our previous leaks had been swift and brutal. We couldn't afford any mistakes. We decided to enlist the help of a coalition of whistleblowers, journalists, and activists who had joined our cause. Using their networks, we planned a coordinated release that would hit every major news outlet, social media platform, and independent news site simultaneously. It was an all-out information blitz. The night of the release, the air was thick with tension. We were scattered across different safe houses, connected through encrypted communications. At the designated time, we executed our plan. The data flooded the internet, accompanied by detailed explanations and commentary from experts in various fields. The reaction was immediate and explosive. The revelations sent shockwaves through society. People were horrified, outraged, and terrified by the extent of the government's deception and the implications of their experiments. Protests erupted worldwide, demanding accountability and an end to the secret programs. But the government didn't sit idly by. They launched an aggressive crackdown, attempting to silence, dissent, and discredit the information. Martial law was declared in several areas, and mass arrests of activists and journalists followed. The situation was dire, but we had anticipated this response. Using our network of allies, we continued to release more data, ensuring that the truth remained accessible. Dr. Sloan's testimony, along with other insiders who had come forward, added credibility to our cause. The pressure on the government mounted, and cracks began to appear in their defenses. One night, while monitoring the news from our latest hideout, we saw something unexpected. High-ranking officials started to resign, and some even came forward, admitting their involvement and corroborating our findings. The tide was turning, but the fight was far from over. As the government's grip weakened, we seized the opportunity to push for more transparency and accountability. We coordinated with international human rights organizations and legal experts to demand independent investigations and trials for those responsible for the atrocities of Project Skinwalker. Amidst the chaos, Jake finally began to heal. The nightmares that had haunted him started to fade, replaced by a sense of purpose. He became a vocal advocate for the victims, sharing his story and rallying support for our cause. His bravery inspired many, and his words carried weight. Months passed, and the world slowly started to change. The investigations uncovered more hidden projects and led to the dismantling of several clandestine operations. 
new laws were enacted to prevent such abuses of power and a global movement for government transparency gained momentum. But the fight was never truly over. The remnants of the old regime still lurked in the shadows and new threats emerged. We remained vigilant, knowing that our work was far from done. The truth had been a powerful weapon, but it was also a fragile one. As for me, I found a new kind of peace in the struggle. The horrors I had witnessed and the friends I had lost were scars that would never fully heal. But I had found a purpose, a reason to keep fighting. We had exposed the darkness and in doing so, we had lit a spark of hope. The journey had been long and harrowing, but it had also forged unbreakable bonds and uncovered the resilience of the human spirit. We were no longer just a group of fugitives. We were a beacon of resistance, a testament to the power of truth and the unyielding will to fight for a better world. And so we continued our mission, always moving forward, always vigilant. The story of Project Skinwalker had been told, but our quest for justice and truth was just beginning. Together, we would face whatever came next knowing that we had the strength to endure and the courage to prevail.